It's honestly pretty interesting to think of how passionately people get over something like a video game character. The protagonist or character that you play as makes sense for people to get attached to. People spend anywhere from 20 to 40 hours plus playing as them and through a good storytelling and character development they become someone real basically. You get attached to them. You know their wants, their needs, their desires, you feel for them, and in a way that's not too different than a close friend. It's the difference between having a character that's just tolerable or maybe even completely likable. A good example for someone like this would be Joel from The Last of Us, for me particularly. You know his backstory, who he is, where he comes from, and the mentality he has entering this apocalyptic world that has fallen apart. His life his world was ripped apart in the moment he lost his daughter, Sarah. He became hardened by grief, distant, unemotional. His sole drive was just to survive from the moment his daughter died moving forward. He was a completely different person. It's not until the progression of that game's story and spending so much time with Ellie that Joel's character arc, well, essentially a full circle, because at the end of the game, his heart and shell was cracked and he has pretty much taken up a role of being a father figure to Ellie, but what he was before the world went to hell, he is again. Albeit the circumstances are, of course, undeniably different, the world is still a cold, hard, and dangerous place, but he is capable and willing to do whatever it takes to protect his daughter, Ellie. A girl that's actually not too far off from the age his daughter was when she died. Joel becomes likable, and his character development, while being a full circle, is still one that makes him likable, and his goals and reasons for doing what he does, while they may be questionable, are still very much understandable. I like Joel, and I believe he's a large part as to why that game is so great. He's not a bad character by any means, I think it's quite the contrary, but when you look at someone like Joel compared to say Arthur Morgan, where Arthur's character development and the circumstances of his shifting priorities and mentality behind it, I would say makes him a great character, especially because of the pacing in which he's developed in. The first five hours or so of Red Dead Redemption 2 spent basically making him seem like a mindless brute. Terrifying and antagonistic is all he's really seen as. That, and of course loyal, but when we see he's got a love interest and the reason as to why he has a certain position against John isn't because of some dumb rivalry on who does more for the gang that they're in or who's in the good graces of Dutch but rather why he's so standoffish against John is because he's hurt. He was so easily tossed away and forgotten about by someone who he considered a genuine brother. That actually hurt him and he hid that hurt behind the code of the gang that they're meant to be and stay loyal to each other and to Dutch, but deep down why he continued to give John so much shit and told him to leave again, ultimately it was just his pain and anger manifesting into pushing his brother away. Of course there's other differences where we actually see Arthur pass away on screen and he's got other relationships tied to John, Charles, there's a mesh up of his life before he got sick and how his life is spiraling out of control while he's slowly approaching his deathbed. So circumstances are a little different between Arthur and Joel. The material is drastically different, but as I was saying, there's a contrast between a good character and a great one. And whenever you're dealing with a great character, typically if there's anyone that's antagonistic or oppositional to him, that might seem to be the polar opposite or the story is being told through that particular character's perspective, naturally we're gonna have a biased view. We all accept our character's view which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But when the character's done so well, and you feel for them on so many different levels, it becomes difficult for people to see the opposing view, especially from the side of the person irritating us or irritating the main character that we're playing as. In this case, that's Micah Bell. Go easy on him, Morgan. He was out trying to find a lead. Same as you, same as Hosea. All you do is complain when things don't work out. Except when it's your goddamn fault. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't give a damn about nobody but yourself. Oh, you act so high and mighty, but you're no better than the rest of us. It's funny how well Rockstar has made Micah such a hated character. I wouldn't describe him as bad, because I don't think he's bad. At least not as a character. A bad person, definitely. But to give you an idea of how hated Micah is, I mean, you cannot give him any kind of credit whatsoever without someone talking shit for defending this piece of shit. But the one thing I think Micah never gets credit for is he never changes. Arguably, he's the most static character throughout the beginning to the end 
of the game. The only difference I would say that Micah really has is that there's a sense of confidence and a heightened level of impunity thanks to how close he's become with Dutch. But seemingly everyone goes through changes with the exception of him. Arthur and John go through changes. John becomes more dedicated to Jack and Abigail, something that's immediately noted after Jack's kidnapping at the hands of the Braithwaites and Angela Bronte. Arthur changes for a number of reasons, mixed with his declining health, a small resuscitation to his love interest with Mary Linton, regret over the Downs family and Dutch's growing worthlessness, Dutch changes, even smaller characters such as Lenny, Sadie, Charles. But Micah never really does. Seemingly from the very moment you first see him on screen, he's seen as someone who enjoys the torment of others. He messes with Sadie when he finds her hiding out at her ranch and finds pleasure in tormenting this woman that's not only terrified, but completely vulnerable. As early as Coulter, Micah makes comments on how unfair it is that here he is doing all this work, bringing in all this money for Dutch, for the gang. And yet, still somehow, there are other people that are not earning their own keep, that are freeloading, that are taking it easy off of all of his hard work. And that, of course, is Micah's position on the women and Jack. And because they're being freeloaders, it's up to him to pick up the slack. This is kind of a sentiment that Micah repeats throughout the game. It's somewhat hand in hand with going back and reclaiming the money that was lost in Blackwater, just taking the money and shedding the dead weight. He even repeats it again during Beaver Hollow, contributing to Dutch's final decision to just let Abigail be hanged for murder when she's captured by Agent Milton. There's even a point where he sarcastically mentions how he cares so much for the gang and all of its members and he just can't help it. Maybe he's right, Dutch. Maybe I have pushed too hard got us into situations that could have been safer. I just, I see all those mouths we gotta feed, and I, I dream too big, caring too much. That's my problem. Caring too much? There's no such thing. Granted, Dutch plays along with it and echoes Micah's sentiment, which in the moment just seems like the two of them are jokingly bullshitting, but as a joke or otherwise. Where Micah stands and how he feels is something that is immediately apparent from the start. He never has a change of heart, a character evolution, a change of who he was or what he valued like Dutch, or even a shift in priorities like John and Arthur. Instead, what we get is a deeper look at who he has always been. I've mentioned before that Micah is, well, unforgettable, somewhat sparse if you really look at it. During Horseshoe Overlook, he's only present in two missions. One involves saving him at Dutch's request, a mission that further sets the tone of his willingness to kill and take back what's his, no matter who stands in his way. It's also the first real interaction between him and Arthur that we see. I got an opportunity to watch you be savage. Well, you gotta do something. Why? I always looked up to you, Arthur. Well, that's your first mistake. <laughs> you can sense the tension between the two of them. He's understandably submissive towards Arthur here because, well, his life obviously depends on it, but he continues to have a submissive demeanor towards Arthur, even though it's somewhat agitating. It's still harmless. It's not quite the level of disrespect that he later displays, but the general disposition towards him is still the same. Well, the gang gets its pace. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, big shadow, tiny tree. And like I said, that still don't mean nothing. In the next chapter of Clement's Point, again, Mike is only present in two missions, technically three, as he defends the camp with Kieran while everyone else goes to launch an assault on Braithwaite Manor while looking for Jack. Now, I don't really consider that all too significant, and if we want to add some deeper meaning to this, that honestly probably doesn't exist. The whole assault on Braithwaite Manor I consider an apex moment in terms of unity of the Vanderland gang. I mean, this shot of all of them walking up to Braithwaite Manor is still one of the coolest moments in the entire game. I think it's only second to everyone riding down from the hilltop onto the oil refinery in my last boy but all of the enforcers are present the only two here that aren't is a formal driscoll that's more of a horse groomer than an actual gunman and then of course micah that in of itself could be the developers giving us a representation of micah's loyalty anyways apart from that micah was crucial in convincing dutch to meet up with colm resulting in arthur's kidnapping now, there's no direct evidence that Micah played a part in it, although it is one of the first suspicious moments of Micah actually taking an initiative to get rid of Arthur. Again, there's never 100% 
indisputable proof that Micah had an actual hand in Arthur's kidnapping and subsequent torture, but the circumstances surrounding it and Dutch's lack of finding it odd that Arthur just didn't turn up, supplemented by Micah's indifferent demeanor to the condition Arthur is in when he does return to camp, definitely makes one wonder. His only other one major appearance in Clemens Point is during a short walk in a pretty town where he, Bill, Arthur, and Sean all get ambushed by the Gray family. During the chapter of Sound and E, there's a stagecoach stick up you, that you can do with Micah, but as far as the main missions go, he's only present during the robbery of the bank of Saint Denis. He's obviously present during the entire chapter of Gorma, but neither the entire chapter of Gorma or the Saint Denis bank robbery does he have any notable presence. He's there, yes, but the spotlight is put more on the rest of the gang members, and of course Dutch, who's having more and more of a looser grip on his own values something that Arthur is obviously witnessing contributing to Arthur's own introspection and reevaluation. Micah's biggest presence is during the chapter of Beaver Hollow, at least as far as missions go. He's never seen in more than two missions at a time, with the exception of Gorma, but while being present in as nearly as many missions as he is in Beaver Hollow, he still doesn't have that much of an on-screen presence. He more so blends into the background. It's Beaver Hollow where he doubles down on how he is during Horseshoe Overlook. It's the catering to Dutch and getting in Arthur's face, albeit more disrespectful and willing to put Arthur in his quote-unquote place, but if the roles were reversed during Horseshoe Overlook and Micah would be Dutch's right-hand man as he is in Beaver Hollow, I don't think he would act any different towards Arthur than he does here. It may be dialed back a bit since Arthur isn't sick and there would be more members readily available to defend him from Micah and Dutch would be less inclined to support the way Micah talks at least openly since the pressure on him is not only there to the level that it is during Beaver Hollow, but we have a more coherent gang, a gang that resembles more of a family. The women are still around, Jack is still around, Jose is still alive. There would be more of a fuss for Micah treating Arthur the way that he does. Really many people in this game aren't actually seen in too many missions if you think about it. The only ones in a majority of them is Arthur, obviously because the game takes place through his own account, and of course Dutch. To think that Micah has such a minuscule presence during the middle of the game's events and still manages to have the presence and irritation from us as if he's always around is a testament to how Rockstar skillfully utilize the little time that they may be given with each character to not only set the tone of a certain relationship's dynamic, but the basics of that character's personality. Another thing I want to point out that someone said that Micah doesn't get enough credit for is just how smart he is. He understood this gang's dynamic. He understood the culture and the morals, the values, and that Dutch was the center of it all. Whether if Micah genuinely had a love and dedication to Dutch is debatable. I feel he genuinely did, although just because he had that love and dedication doesn't mean he had that same level of loyalty and willingness to protect and defend Dutch over himself. But ultimately in the end, while many people find him annoying and irritating, I, I find Micah to be one of the more interesting characters, just how he's presented. As I said, he's not a bad character. Bad guy, yes. He's an interesting character with no morals, very few values, and a person whose goals and interests sometimes may be a little gray or shady, but ultimately, I still find his presence interesting. It's hard to think of how the game would be if we didn't have someone like Micah. At times, it's almost like you actually need him. Arthur's really not someone that's challenged all too often, and now we have this thorn in our side in the presence of Micah who likes to annoy, likes to agitate. But let me know what you think. What's your position on Micah? Do you, do you agree with me? Do you feel like he doesn't change at all during the story? He just becomes more of who he was from the start? And do you think the story of Red Dead Redemption 2 ultimately needs Micah? I'll be down in the comments section talking to you. And like always, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you on the next video.